Welcome to video four of week nine. In video two, I introduced the notion of a partial derivative as the first way to extend the notion of derivatives to these scalar fields. Today, we're gonna to introduce the second notion, which is the gradient. Most of these other notions we introduce are gonna be some way of putting the partial derivatives together into whole, one holistic notion. The gradient does this by taking the vector of partial derivatives. So if I have a scalar field defined in Rn, then I have partial derivatives in each of the variables of Rn. I can put those into a vector, which I'm gonna call the gradient and give this symbol. This little triangle thing is read as nabla, so we call this nabla f. And we think of this as a local direction vector. So if I have a bunch of points in Rn, I think about temperature as a typical type of scalar field. In each of these points, I'm gonna get a local direction, which is given by this vector of partial derivatives. What does that local direction mean? Well, it is going to always indicate the direction of greatest increase. So from this point, this is the direction where the temperature is going to increase the most quickly. From this point, this is the direction that the temperature is going to increase the most quickly. The gradient is the direction of greatest increase. And let me talk about a really important example of how that works. In physics, with conservative forces, so forces like gravity and electromagnetism, we can define them via a potential energy field, and often this is the way it is done, and the gradient is central to that definition. So if I have a gravitational situation with a big mass m at the origin in R3, and some other uh, smaller mass m at some coordinates x, y, and z, then the potential energy of this gravitational situation, of this little mass m separated from this large mass m, is defined to be negative g, g is the gravitational constant, product of the masses divided by the distance between them. This denominator is exactly the length of this vector. So if I call this r, this is often written negative g m m over r, the distance between them. I wanna write it in vector notation. That's the conventional definition of potential energy due to gravity. Let me look at the gradient of that. And I've not done the calculation here in the video. Feel free to check that if I take the derivative in x and derivative in y and derivative in z, I get something that has a common term here and the x-coordinate gives me an x, the y-coordinate gives me y, the z-coordinate gives me a z. Again, skipping the calculations for this video. But I get a vector and this vector points in the x, y, z direction. So it actually points from m out here, the direction of greatest increase of potential energy is directly away from the center, mass at the center, the mass at the origin. The principle of conservative forces is that conservative forces act to decrease the potential energy as much as possible. So this is the greatest increase in potential energy. The greatest decrease in potential energy is directly the opposite. So I wanna look at the negative gradient and that points me right back towards the origin. Moreover, if I take this thing and scale it by its length so that I get a unit vector here, this is a vector of length one, then this gives me the direction as a unit vector of length one, and what's left over here is the magnitude of the vector, and this is exactly the force of gravity, g m m over the distance between the two objects squared in the conventional understanding of the force of gravity. So the force of gravity can be given as the negative gradient of the potential, since that points in the direction of greatest decrease, and that's what the physics says that things should do. Things want to decrease their potential energy as quickly as possible. And this is, this is a, a huge archetype in physics of how systems work. As we define a potential energy field, the gradient gives us the direction that things are going to move in. Really, really central, really important application of what the gradient is. Let me do another example for you. This one's less fu fundamental. This is just sort of one I made up. So I'm thinking about a cylinder here, which is spinning. So this is going around. And as it's spinning, the material in the cylinder then gets sort of pushed out to the side. And so I get a pressure field. And the pressure field is larger the further away I am from the origin. Within a certain range, say this thing has radius 3, so within x and y from 0 to root 3. Uh, and it has a certain height, and the pressure also depends inversely on the height. So the pressure is larger down here and smaller up here. There's some kind of gravitational effect that again pushes things down. 
So I can calculate the gradient of this thing. So take the partial derivative of an x, partial derivative of y, partial derivative of z. I've skipped those calculations, but feel free to check them. And I can look at where this gradient points. And this gradient is going to be pointing outward in x and y and downward in z. So it's going to be pointing in these kind of directions. And that makes perfect sense because we know that the pressure is largest near the outside of the cylinder, so these things are pointing out, and the pressure is largest at the bottom of the cylinder, sort of pointing slightly down. So we can really see fairly clearly in this situation how the gradient is pointing in the direction that the pressure increases um, towards the outside and down. Lastly, before the end of this video, I want to talk a little bit about this Nobla thing. So by itself, this is a differential operator, which is the vector of the partial differential operators. So we think of this thing, thing that takes the partial derivative in x1, the partial derivative in x2, all the way down. So nabla f was the vector of partial derivatives for the gradient. There's a bunch of other things we can do with nabla. Nabla squared is a thing that we, happens when you take this and take the dot product with the gradient, and that's going to be the partial in x, uh, the partial in x again, it's going to give me the second partial in x1, partial in x2, partial in x2, give me the second partial in x2, all the way up to the second partial in xn. So it's the sum of the pure second partials. And this was the thing that showed up in video three when I talked about the other differential, other partial differential equations like the Schrodinger equation and the Navier-Stokes equation. And I can actually give new versions of the heat equation and the wave equation. This thing, which is called the Laplacian, is really our, our best notion of the concavity second derivative extended to more than one variable. So in the heat equation here, I had concavity second derivatives for the one-dimensional situation. Those all get replaced with the Laplacian. So this is just to make you aware of, of sort of the use of this symbol. Think of it as a vector operator, differential operator in vector form used to define the gradient and now used to define this Laplacian, this Laplacian measuring that notion of concavity.